a fabulous collection of stories about the nanny Mary Poppins who looks after Jane and Michael. It's also a fabulous film and wonderful musical with lots of toe tapping and sing along numbers. Mary Poppins took out a large bottle labelled one teaspoon to be taken at bedtime. A spoon was attached to the neck of the bottle and into this Mary Poppins poured a dark crimson fluid. Is that your medicine? inquired Michael, looking very interested. No, yours, said Mary Poppins, holding out the spoon to him. Michael stared, wrinkled up his nose and he began to protest. I don't want it, I don't need it, I won't. But Mary Poppins' eyes were fixed upon him and Michael suddenly discovered that you could not look at Mary Poppins and disobey her. There was something strange and extraordinary about her, something that was frightening and at the same time most exciting. The spoon came nearer. He held his breath, shut his eyes and gulped. A delicious taste ran round his mouth. He turned his tongue in it. He swallowed and a happy smile ran round his face. Strawberry ice, he said ecstatically. More, more, more. But Mary Poppins, her face as stern as before, was pouring out a dose for Jane. It ran into the spoon, silvery, greeny, yellowy. Jane tasted it. Lime juice cordial, she said, sliding her tongue deliciously over her lips. But when she saw Mary Poppins moving towards the twins with the bottle, Jane rushed at her. Oh no, please, they're too young. It wouldn't be good for them, please. Mary Poppins, however, took no notice. But with a warning, terrible glance at Jane, tipped the spoon toward John's mouth. He lapped at it eagerly, and by the few drops that were spilt on his bib, Jane and Michael could tell that the substance in the spoon this time was milk. Then Barbara had her share, and she gurgled and licked the spoon twice. Mary Poppins then poured out another dose and solemnly took it herself. Rum punch, she said, smacking her lips and corking the bottle. Jane's eyes and Michael's popped with astonishment, but they were not given much time to wonder. For Mary Poppins, having put the miraculous bottle on the mantelpiece, turned to them. Now, she said, spit spot, into bed. And she began to undress them. They noticed that whereas buttons and hooks had needed all sorts of coaxing from Katie Nana, for Mary Poppins, they flew apart almost at a look. In less than a minute, they found themselves in bed and watching, by the dim light from the nightlight, the rest of Mary Poppins' unpacking being performed. From the carpet bag, she took out seven flannel nightgowns, four cotton ones, a pair of boots, a set of dominoes, two bathing caps and a postcard album. Last of all came a folding camp bedstead with blankets, an eider-down complete, and this she set down between John's cot and Barbara's. Jane and Michael sat hugging themselves and watching. It was also surprising that they could find nothing to say. But they knew both of them that something strange and wonderful had happened at number 17 Cherry Tree Lane. Mary Poppins, slipping one of the flannel nightgowns over her head, began to undress underneath it as though it were a tent. Michael, charmed by the strange new arrival, unable to keep silent any longer, called to her. Mary Poppins, he cried. You'll never leave us, will you? There was no reply from under the nightgown. Michael could not bear it. You won't leave us, will you? He called anxiously. Mary Poppins' head came out of the top of the nightgown. She looked fierce. One more word from that direction, she said threateningly, and I'll call the policeman. I was only saying, began Michael meekly, that we hoped you wouldn't be going away soon. He stopped, feeling very red and confused. Mary Poppins stared from Jane to him in silence. Then she sniffed. I'll stay until the wind changes, she said shortly, and she blew out her candle and got into bed. That's all right, said Michael half to himself and half to Jane. But Jane wasn't listening. She was thinking about all that had happened and wondering. <laughs>